Okay, I think we'll make a start. Welcome everybody and many thanks for joining us today for this public talk with Professor Kazim Rahimi, who will be telling us about his research into whether lowering blood pressure can help to prevent type two diabetes. This session is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. My name is Sarah Ma, and I'm the Events Marketing and Engagement Manager for the NIHR Oxford Biomedical Research Centre. The Oxford BRC is based at the Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and is run in partnership with the University of Oxford and as such combines the research expertise of the University of Oxford, Oxford and the clinical skills of NHS staff with the aim of translating scientific breakthroughs into clinical benefits for patients. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Professor Kazim Rahimi and thank him for his time today. Professor Rahimi is a Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine and Population Health at the University of Oxford and a consultant cardiologist at the Oxford University Hospitals. His research interests include hypertension, heart failure, multimorbidity and cardiovascular risk management using a variety of methodologies. Professor Rahimi leads the Deep Medicine Programme at, at the Nuffield Department of Women's and Reproductive Health, as well as leading an international collaboration of all the major trials of blood pressure lowering drugs. All of you attending this talk are on mute with video off. If you have any questions for Professor Rahimi, please post them in the chat function and we will um, put them to him at the end of his presentation. Now I'll hand over to Professor Rahimi to start his presentation. Thank you. Sarah, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have been part of NIHR Oxford BRC, who has been instrumental in funding the research that we have been doing over the past few years. So I've been asked to just talk about the relationship between blood pressure or lowering blood pressure and risk of diabetes. So there will be plenty of time for discussion and if you have any questions at the end. So roughly speaking, we have got um, a few classes of drugs that we call antihypertensives that are mainly used for blood pressure reduction. These drugs have been widely investigated over the past couple of decades to assess their impact predominantly um, on uh, cardiovascular outcomes. They are now a cornerstone of treatment for prevention of heart attack, heart failure, and stroke. But there have been a number of uh, reports linking blood pressure reduction or those drugs to a range of other outcomes that goes from peripheral arterial disease, chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury, um, physical conditioning, false collapse, atrial fibrillation, even cancer, dementia, some of those have been investigated extensively and we know a lot about them. Some of them are part of active research and others are waiting to be investigated further. So I'm gonna to focus today mainly on the link between those drugs, blood pressure reduction and risk of diabetes. First, we should say, why does it matter? If one looks at the uh, link of all known risk factors, to causes of uh, premature death and disability, elevated blood pressure and raised blood sugar come in the top five in men and women across the world. Here to the left, if one looks at the fraction of the risk in women that is being attributed to systolic blood pressure, high systolic blood pressure and elevated blood sugar, um, number one is blood pressure, number three is glucose, and if one looks at it at men, unfortunately still smoking is worldwide the number one killer, but that is followed by elevated blood pressure and uh, raised blood sugar comes ranking five. And these are just looking at the death rates and the causes of premature death globally. But if one looks at the disability that these risk factors cause, the picture is very similar. If one looks, takes a cross section of any um, society, the picture that we see is that elevated blood pressure and diabetes tend to coexist. Uh, people who have elevated blood pressure tend to have diabetes and vice versa. 
And that relationship, that co-occurrence of those risk factors of condition in the same individual um, is greater than what we would be expecting from chance alone. And that begs the question about what is the link between them? Is this one causing the other, or is it just a spurious relationship that we're observing? And this is um, the, the way a scientist would look at it. So you've got two risk factors or two conditions that appear to be linked. So one possibility is in that case that elevated blood pressure would cause diabetes. So as shown with this orange arrow, but it's also, of course, also possible that the relationship goes the other way around, something that we call reverse causality, that type two diabetes might cause the blood pressure to go up. And it might be that the relationship is entirely indirect, is not related to those diseases at all. Um, so the, the, those diseases could have common uh, causes um, or risk factors. For instance, imagine um, obesity. Obesity is well known to uh, raise blood pressure and is also a risk factor of obesity. So it might be that when we observe that ele elevated blood pressure and diabetes are linked, we are just seeing a, a mask effect of obesity um, and there is no causal relationship between the two. The same applies with treatments. You can imagine that there are treatments that uh, patients are using for treatment of either blood pressure elevation or type two diabetes or even other conditions that create an apparent uh, linkage between those two conditions. Um, but of course, the people who are affected by those two conditions or risk factors are very likely to um, have um, genes and have environment that is also shared. So it could be that what we observe is just the effect of common genes of common and shared environments. And the challenge that you're facing to investigate whether that orange, uh, orange arrow is real, whether there is a causal relationship between elevated blood pressure and risk of type 2 diabetes. And the reason why it's important is only once we've established that that link is causal, we can start intervening. We can explore how we can, how reducing one risk factor could affect the risk of the other. And that is principally applies to all type of research that we do in medicine. But if one looks at it from a biological point of view, is there actually a reason why those two could be causally linked? And the answer to that is yes. There have been some basic science done by other groups that have suggested that there are some plausible mechanisms that link um, elevated blood pressure with diabetes. Uh, for instance, we know that elevated blood pressure can cause a systemic, systemic inflammation and that in turn uh, might be uh, causing diabetes. Uh, there are also reports saying that elevated blood pressure could affect insulin sensitivity, sensitivity uh, which is also uh, related to diabetes. And finally, we know that elevated blood pressure affects the vessel wall, the endothelium, which is the, the, the cells that coat the small vessels, and a, a malfunctioning of those cells could also increase the risk of diabetes. So we've got some idea that there could be a biological link um, so then we need to go into assessing whether clinically we can um, establish that causation or whether all of those suggested biological me mechanisms are just signals that don't uh, materialize into anything substantial from clinical point of view. And the way we start investigating it clinically, um, one of the uh, uh, standard ways that epidemiology, epidemiologists look at it is to conduct um, a so-called cohort studies. And court studies are, in a sense, longitudinal studies where we would start with, um, with people not having the disease, in this case, diabetes at baseline, and follow them over time to just see how many of those individuals develop diabetes. And then we can make an estimation of the association um, between the two. And by having that longitudinal element and the time element, we can at least be fairly confident that reverse causality, that is diabetes causing the blood pressure to go up, is minimized. If diabetes happens years after the blood pressure has been elevated at baseline, then of course there's less likely that we had a reverse causality. And that work was done by our team a few years ago. We are fortunate in the UK that uh, we as patients make our data available in an anonymized fashion for research and the data that our GPs are collecting as hospitals are collecting are incredible values, valuable sources of um, research. 
So in this study, we used data from 4 million uh, people, that is the routine records in, in UK, to uh, look at the association between blood pressure and risk of diabetes. So here um, in the bottom, as you can see in the x-axis, we would start with people who have no diabetes at baseline, but some of them tend to have a lower blood pressure, some of them higher blood pressure. We just rank them according to the blood pressure into different categories. This is the systolic blood pressure. We can do the same thing for diastolic blood pressure. And then we follow them up um, for several years to just see who develops diabetes. And if one does that um, and plots them against each other, as you can just see here, in people whose systolic blood pressure was higher to start up with, they had a substantially increased risk of diabetes. And the same pattern was seen in, in people whose diastolic blood pressure was elevated. And numerically, one can calculate how strong the association is. Um, and in this study, for every 20 millimeter mercury higher systolic blood pressure, the risk of diabetes was increased by 60%. So um, as I've said before, this suggests that the, the, the link between the two could be causal, but that does not establish causation um, definitely, because some of those common risk factors, common um, causes of those conditions uh, might not have been fully eliminated, or what, as we call it, they might not have been fully adjusted for um, in the statistical models. So in order to just prove that further, what we need is randomized clinical trials. And randomized clinical trials are the gold standard of establishing a causal link. And the way they work is we would start again with a group of people who have no diabetes at baseline. And then they would be like a toss of a coin um, grouped into a, a category where one group will receive a blood pressure reduction treatment. The other group will receive no blood pressure reduction. Um, and then they would be followed up for a certain period of time, typically for several years for us to just get enough information. And at the end of the follow-up, a fraction of the people in each of those groups will develop diabetes. And we can simply calculate the ratio between the two groups to estimate um, the effect of the treatment that we have had um, on the outcome. And the beauty of these randomized clinical trials is that by design, all known and unknown common causes that could affect diabetes or blood pressure cancel each other out. One would expect that those uh, common causes are distributed roughly equally between the two groups. There's no reason why uh, tossing a coin would uh, substantially end up having one uh, ca category of patients more in one group than the other, assuming that the sample size is large enough. So that essentially provides the, the, the basis of establishing the causation. And this is what we did um, in, a, in a more recent study uh, where we looked at the randomized effect of uh, blood pressure lowering. Um, in order to be able to investigate that, one needs really very large sample sizes um, of people who are volunteered to participate in this study. And here we had access to information from about 150,000 randomized participants who had participated in 19 clinical trials. I have to say my uh, gratitude goes to those patients who have volunteered to participate in those clinical trials, taking a drug a lot of the time with, a not, with an uncertain effect on their health status, but without their participation, we would not be able to conduct those studies. And I'm also grateful for people who have shared the data subsequently for us to be able to analyze it. So in that particular data cut that we have had, people were followed up for about uh, four and a half years. And during this uh, follow-up time, about 10,000 of them uh, developed um, a new diagnosis of um, diabetes or whether diagnosed uh, with type 2 diabetes. And here, as I've explained earlier, we can just simply calculate the ratio between the two. And what we see is that for a five millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure, um, the risk of diabetes was reduced by 11%. So this gives us confidence that that relationship that we had observed in previous cohort studies is indeed causal. That means lowering blood pressure is likely to reduce the risk of people developing type two diabetes. Now, one of the uh, questions that here comes up, you know, we have looked at studies that have used antihypertensive drugs for blood pressure reduction, 
Um, despite the fact that we have looked at a uh, fixed amount of blood pressure reduction, a five millimeter mercury systolic blood pressure reduction, a valid question is, was it a blood pressure reduction per se, or was it just because antihypertensives reduce blood pressure? In other words, would we be seeing the same effect if blood pressure is reduced through other means, let's say through devices or through lifestyle changes? We cannot answer that question with those drug trials because by definition, all intervention, all blood pressure reduction was due to people taking tablets or no tablets. But one way of looking at it um, differently um, so in, in clinical trials, as I just said, it's a combination of the effect. What we see is the net effect that we see is the blood pressure reduction, as well as the drug effects that might have other effects. And in order to just um, go a bit further and see whether blood pressure, pressure reduction on its own reduces risk of um, diabetes, um, we, we use another method, which is called Mendelian randomization. And that is, if you like, the nature's randomized clinical trials. So we use genetic data to mimic um, uh, randomized clinical trials. And as you can see from the picture here, the design is very similar. The difference is that we start with people um, at conception where uh, people have no diabetes to start up with. Uh, we know that there are a range of genes that predispose people um, to have a higher or lower blood pressure. And if we just look for those genes and combine them, we can group people based on uh, the, the genes that they have inherited that puts them in a category of having a low blood pressure or a high blood pressure, and then we can compare the, the two groups. So the beauty here is again that uh, a, a randomization takes place at conception. Randomly, each of us will be allocated different types of genes, um, and um, there is no way that there is reverse causality could be at play, and that randomness works very similar to a randomized clinical trials with the difference that here nature is at play, if you like, in randomized clinical trials, it is a researcher um, that uh, allocates patients randomly into different groups. Um, and the other difference here is that we look at essentially a lifetime effect almost because randomization happens very early in life. Um, so we did that in parallel to get a sense whether blood pressure lowering itself um, has an effect. Um, we now know that there are a number of genetic variants that encode higher blood pressure, um, to be precise, 248 of them. And when one combines them, one can get a good sense of uh, which groups of individuals are likely to have a genetically determined low blood pressure, which group of individuals are likely to have a genetically predicted um, higher blood pressure. And Again, thanks to people volunteering to participate in cohort studies, we have got hundreds of thousands of people um, participating in studies, um, and we can group them, people in whom we know that they don't have diabetes, and 20,000 of people in that particular study that we knew that have diabetes, and we can do the same analysis and replicate and estimate the ratio between the two groups. And what we see here is, coincidentally, the point estimate is almost exactly the same. Um, an 11% lower risk of uh, type 2 diabetes for a 5 millimeter mercury uh, lower systolic blood pressure, um, as shown in the figure. We went even a step further because, you know, what we're interested in science to validate, and we know that one method is not sufficient, one analysis is not sufficient, particularly for questions that are of critical importance to public health. We need to be confident that the results that we are finding are valid and true. And here we just did a so-called positive outcome study. We run the same analysis. Instead of now looking at diabetes, we looked at whether uh, genetically determined higher or lower blood pressure um, has um, a relationship with uh, cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, and ischemic heart disease. And we see here that the relationship was exactly as we would expect it. Of course, we know very well that lowering blood pressure reduces the risk of cardiovascular outcomes. So it would have, in, in a sense, invalidated our findings if this the association here would have looked substantially different, both qualitatively and, uh, qualitatively and, and quantitatively. So to just summarize the, the findings so far, uh, we have seen using different methods that lowering blood pressure by about five millimeter mercury systolic, which is roughly the effect of taking one tablet, one type of drug for blood pressure reduction, reduces the relative risk of people developing type two diabetes by 
And those relative risk reductions, the magnitude of risk reduction is similar to what we have seen for prevention of heart attack, stroke, and heart failure. So this is not insignificant, it's clinically important, the difference that, that is observed. Now, the next question that arises is, we've got a range of drugs that we use for um, blood pressure lowering. Are they all equally good at preventing diabetes? I won't go too much into the de details of the method, but there is a way of investigating that too, which we have done in parallel. So in a sense, in brief, instead of comparing the effect of blood pressure lowering, looking at the differences in blood pressure between the two groups, we compare directly or indirectly the effect of drug A versus drug B, which could be placebo. Um, and we can do the same thing with Mendelian randomization with those genetic studies where instead of looking at genes that predict uh, blood pressure differences, we look at genes that predict the drug targets uh, based specifically for the type of drugs that are being used. Those may or may not be related to blood pressure uh, reduction. And one can do that and again, calculate the ratio. Um, and if one does that, we are currently using um, four or five main classes of drugs in, in practice for blood pressure reduction. And this is a summary of the results where the um, evidence from randomized clinical trials called network estimates here is directly presented next to Mendelian randomization evidence from those genetic studies for those uh, four different groups of drugs. And what we see here is that for ACE inhibitors and ARBs, we see a relatively consistent effect between those two very different methods. Um, and here we see a strong signal for those drugs preventing um, uh, type two diabetes. For beta blockers, we see the opposite effect. Despite their blood pressure lowering effect, they, they, they tend to cause diabetes. And again, that effect is consistent using two, two different methods. For calcium channel blockers, um, there is no material effect on type two diabetes um, uh, in one way or the other, despite the blood pressure lowering effect. Um, and for tyrosate diuretics, the effect is um, inconsistent between the two methods, largely because from Indian randomization, we don't have enough um, statistical power um, to just detect it, but very likely that um, the, the clinical trial evidence here is valid and that they cause diabetes too. And this is roughly also something that we have been aware of in clinical literature, but this quantifies this more precisely um, and uh, reduces the uncertainties that have been around. So to just summarize um, this um, section of the talk, we see that some types of drugs, um, in particular ACE inhibitors and ARBs have a strong preventive effect on type two diabetes. Others like calcium channel blockers have no clear effect um, and others could cause diabetes. Um, that is in particular beta blockers and thiazide diuretics, but I should emphasize that they would still have a net beneficial effect on cardiovascular disease prevention. So why is it important? I mean, if one looks at it globally, um, we see a rising burden of diabetes worldwide. These are figures that show the prevalence is rising in part due to population aging and population growth in different parts of the world. By showing that evidence that blood pressure lowering can prevent diabetes, we have got yet another reason to keep our blood pressure down. And we can formulate clear recommendations about non-pharmacological ways of reducing the risk of diabetes, and for instance, salt reduction will reduce um, blood pressure. And that, based on this evidence, is very likely in turn to also reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. We also see that um, the other implication is that we see that certain classes of drugs that are not implicated in affecting blood sugar directly can prevent diabetes. And in my view, this is exciting news, where instead of focusing on the blood sugar pathway for prevention of diabetes, we can look into opportunities where um, novel drugs can affect and help prevent diabetes to curb the, the growing rise of um, blood pressure globally. So um, th th there are a few minutes that I would like to spend talking about um, blood pressure and what is normal. Uh, perhaps a question to you to just think about it, what do you think is a good blood pressure, um, assuming that you haven't got any major health conditions? Because this is a, a question that I see uh, a bit being confused and uh, seeing patients in clinics sometimes 
um, they report that their blood pressure is good um, uh, without not um, being aware of what, what might be a good or optimal blood pressure. I mean, if one looks at the history of blood pressure research, we have come a very far way where, you know, in, in, before 1900, we thought all blood pressure is part of, uh, part of the process of aging. And if it goes high, that is just natural and we should not do anything about it. Only at the beginning of the century, last century, we saw that there were some associations between elevated blood pressure and death. Um, but even in 1945, people felt that a blood pressure of um, 186 over 108 is something that does not require treatment and is normal. That was the case in Franklin Roosevelt's medical records who died of stroke with a very high blood pressure. Um, and even in 1966, medical textbook referred to uh, treatment not being required when blood pressure is uh, less than 200 over 100 millimeter mercury. Of course, we have moved a bit further since where we now think about hypertension as a disease and classify it when blood pressure is uh, typically greater than 140 over 90 millimeter mercury. But what is uh, a physiologically in natural um, blood pressure? What is the optimal blood pressure? And in order to just understand that, in my view, we should look at the average blood pressure in non-industrialized populations, people who have not been exposed to an to a industrialized lifestyle. And there have been a few studies that have done that. And if, if one looks at those studies, a couple of things emerge is that the systolic blood pressure in those populations tend to be in the order of 90 to 100 millimeter mercury. Um, and that is in men and women to the same level. We don't see a sex specific difference as we see in, in our society. And the second uh, finding is that we also don't see any age related slope. So that blood pressure happens to continue throughout the life. So that gives us an indication probably that that might be the, the norm blood pressure. By contrast, if one looks at the relationship of blood pressure and risk of cardiovascular disease in our society, what we see is a distribution like this. Um, uh, most people will be in the range of, the blood pressure will be in the range of 130 systolic, probably adults, middle-aged, but some will have a very high blood pressure, some will have a lower blood pressure. <clears throat> and the fact is that we, we know that some people whose blood pressure is very high will never suffer a cardiovascular event, and some people whose blood pressure is low will also never suffer a cardiovascular event. Um, and in fact, at the global level, about a third of all deaths that we attribute to elevated systolic blood pressure happen in people whose blood pressure is below 140 millimeter mercury systolic. And there's also good evidence to just show that that relationship between blood pressure and risk of cardiovascular disease extends all the way down to a systolic blood pressure of 90 in healthy individuals. And I won't go into the details of it, but we have got also randomized clinical evidence um, to just show that uh, in people whose blood pressure is apparently normal, um, be below the threshold of hypertension, and the, the relative risk reduction that we see for prevention of cardiovascular disease is uh, consistent uh, among them, irrespective of the blood pressure, uh, when one compares it to people whose blood pressure is um, clearly abnormal. So to just conclude, uh, we see that uh, most of us have an abnormal or elevated blood pressure um, based on the evidence that I've presented. Um, Antihypertensive drugs reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, even when blood pressure is apparently normal. That, of course, does not mean that everyone should be receiving drug therapy and that an individual's overall risk uh, will be the key determinant of um, considering people for treatment. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions that uh, you might have. Thank you very much, um, Professor Rahimi. We do have a question. Thank you very much, Fahim. The question is, in the use of genes that predispose or protect against hypertension, did you also examine for the presence or absence of genes predisposing to diabetes that may cluster with those for hypertension and possibly result in coincidentally inheriting both? Uh, that, is, that is a great question. Yes, we did. Um, so, and and there, there, there is hardly any overlap between the, between the two, but there were a few genes that happened to be in both camps, if you like, and those were eliminated to avoid that uh, potential um, confounding. And the, the results that are presented are uh, not, not subject to those biases. But great question. <laughs>
Thank you, Professor Rahimi. Uh, we don't have any other questions in the chat at this time. Um, perhaps if anybody uh, thinks of a question at a later date, they can email it to me or to Professor Rahimi and he can answer you directly. Um, just a, a, an opportunity for anybody else to pose anything else in the chat. I'll just check. No, nothing at this time. So I think that leads me to say thank you very much for that very interesting, informative talk, Professor Rahimi. We appreciate your time today and uh, look forward to welcoming people in the future for more public talks with the BRC. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>